Well, good morning, Light City, to everybody in our Fort Erie campus, to everybody in Buffalo, to everybody else watching all over the world. We are so excited about this morning. And if you're just tuning in to where we have been this month, we're on the third week of our series on the other side. And uh, this week, the title of my message is Out with the Old. And we've been talking this month about uh, getting to the other side of our mountain, our the, the proverbial mountain in your life, whatever that would be. And, and talking about how in order to get to the other side, we have to win the battles that want to keep us on the side or in the place that you're in right now. And we established in the first week of this month that Oftentimes, the majority of the battles we fight, we know scripture tells us that the battles we fight are not against flesh and blood, they're not against our spouses or people or our bosses or our neighbor, but the majority of the battles that we fight against and face in life are won and lost right here inside of our brain. And that if we want to experience or if we want to have a positive life, we cannot have a negative mind. So really quickly to start off this teaching, let's establish this one fact that if we want to get to the other side, it starts first inside of our mind. And, and really the most famous guy probably in all of scriptures, aside from Jesus, who teaches us how to get to the other side of our mountain is the Apostle Paul. And we've been reading and walking through his life at this particular uh, a period of time. And, and he's in Rome. You know, he, he wanted to come to Rome as a preacher, but he finds himself in Rome right now, not a preacher, but as a prisoner. And in true Paul style, he writes us this amazingly encouraging letter. And, and we're going to read this morning. He's, he's ending his letter in this amazingly uplifting moment, but it's important for us to remember that he's writing this passage of scripture to us in prison, right? We talked about this shackled to guards, rotating guards every eight hours. And Paul is here and he's writing this letter. And, and this is what it says here in Philippians 4, verses 6 to 9. It says this, I was writing this from prison. Okay, it says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Verse 7 says this, and the peace of God, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He goes on to say, finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, he says this, think about such things. He's telling us that, listen, you might be in a situation right now where your brain is wanting to focus on some negative stuff. It's wanting to revert back to maybe some old patterns. And Paul is saying, listen, guys, if you want to get out of it. you got to decide that you're going to do away, that he's out with the old. And he says this in verse 9, whatever you have learned, received, or heard from me, or seen in me, put it into practice. So Paul is laying it out, letting us know, hey, if this is going to happen for you, if you're going to actually walk into this freedom, it's going to be the result of actually doing some of the work. But he says this, hey, if you put it into practice, it says this, the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. So Heavenly Father, this morning as we sit in the different countries, as we begin to take a, a, a look and a glimpse into your word and into the amazing promises that you've given to us about what it looks like to truly get to the other side, what it truly looks like to, to do away with some of those old patterns, those old thought processes, and really begin to step into the newness and the fullness of everything that you have promised to us. We ask this morning, Jesus, that you would lead us into the truth because we know that your truth will set us free. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So let me ask you, how many of you would say that, you know, occasionally or honestly, maybe regularly, you have, you know, some runaway thoughts? You know, maybe you'd say, I have some irrational worries. I have some events that trigger fear or they trigger anxiety in my life. You know, I, I have a story I can remember. I was in, I think it was in like eighth or ninth grade and I had, you know, my best friend at that point in time and we were gonna go away for, you know, I think it was over March break or something, maybe it was five or six days. We were going away to his family's cottage that was up north. And while we were driving up north and we got into the town where we were, um, you know, we, my friend's dad had done something and, you know, cut somebody off maybe or whatever. Let's just say this person was not thrilled with the way that my friend's dad was driving. And so, you know, he followed us home and, you know, that kind of creates enough nervousness. You know, you make a right and they make a right and you make a left and they make a left. And then finally we were pulled into our driveway and this guy stops right at the end of the driveway and then did something that you really only see in movies or, you know, in some weird, you know, fail video somewhere. He gets out of the car and charges my friend's dad. Now, this was a horribly bad decision because my friend's dad, he, let's say he knew how to handle himself. And in a biblical way of describing it, he, you know, laid hands on the guy the guy storms off and, you know, he goes off in his car and speeds away. And, and I remember in this whole event, what marked me is, is that my friend's mom then went on to tell us like, hey, there's a guy that's driving around in, I think it was a green truck. And watch out for this guy. This guy doesn't like your dad. And so watch out for him. If you see a green truck driving around and they're driving up and down the street, just run inside and, you know, lock the door and bolt the door. And, and, and I can remember the whole time that we were there. And honestly, for years after, every time that I would see a green truck, you know, my head would jerk, my heart would start pounding, my stomach would drop, I would find myself like sweating and, 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 and all this stuff happened. And, and, and I feel as though the majority of us have a very similar experience. You know, some of you might be, you know, worried about your grades. You've got a test coming up and you're worried about your grades and you're, you're worried because if you don't get good enough grades, you're not going to get into the college that you want to go to. And if you don't get into the college, you're not going to have the job that you want, that you're supposed to have. And if you don't have the job, how are you ever going to find the perfect spouse? And if you can't find the perfect spouse, then how are you going to ever have the right kids? And then you start worrying about your kids and you're thinking about what school am I going to send my kids to? Am I going to send them to the wrong school where there's, you know, drug, sex, and rock and roll. There's going to be school shootings and they're probably going to get an STD or definitely going to start selling methamphetamines. And then you're thinking, well, they're going to start selling methamphetamines. That must mean that I'm not a good enough mom, that I'm such a bad provider. And then thinking about being a provider makes you worried about your finances and how the kids are going to have braces. And then they're going to have all the activities. They're going to need cars and they're going to need insurance on their cars and they're going to have to go to college. And then you're so worried your brain can't keep up. You're getting a headache. And then you're convincing yourself that now you must have brain cancer all because you were worried about a test that you have to take the next day. And, and it's funny, but I've realized that it's so easy for our minds to run away from us. And so I wanted to talk about this as we, we talk about out with the old is I want to talk a little bit about worry and our brains, because oftentimes I find that our worry, our worries, the worries of life, keep us from getting to the other side. And we established this the first week of this series is that our life will always move in the direction of our strongest thoughts. And this is good if our thoughts are about good things, if they're about happy things, if they're like Paul says, lovely, pure, excellent, of good report. But it also works the same way with bad thoughts. And a bad thought can make us feel afraid. A bad thought can make us feel anxious. A bad thought can make us feel worried. And the crazy thing about fear is that fear often compounds on itself to the place where one bad thought can turn into a bad month. And we talked about it in week one about our brain. And we used a couple of scientific words. I trust that you feel smarter now going through that first week with us. But today I want to introduce another part of the brain, and that is this very, very tiny almond-shaped portion of our brain. This thing is called the amygdala, 
And the amygdala has a very, very specific function. And, 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 and what it does essentially is when we feel afraid, when we feel worried or nervous, the amygdala kicks into full gear. And, and we should all be thankful for our amygdala because it's a very helpful part of our brain that is wired for survival. And science has found out that this little tiny almond shaped thing in our brain is the part of our brain that is responsible for feeling fear. So you get into a dangerous situation, the amygdala kicks in, it fires on, it sends your body this insanely strong dose of adrenaline and, and you're getting ready to move. It's like, for example, for me, I hate snakes. So when I see a snake, immediately my brain says danger. It says run. And that's my amygdala. I was literally just driving here two seconds ago and there was somebody on the phone and they started swerving into my lane and, and, and you know, texting and swerving and my brain immediately kicks in, two hands get on the steering wheel and I swerve out of the way so they don't hit me. It would be like if somebody broke into your house and you hear somebody walking around in your house and immediately your brain says, survive it. All of a sudden, the thing beside you isn't a lamp anymore. Now it's a ninja weapon and you are Bruce Lee and you are ready to throw down. Now, that sounds cool, but the problem is, is that our amygdala is not objective. It has one job. That's it. It does one thing, and that is it's hardwired to protect us from danger. And this is why the amygdala needs help from another part of our brain called the prefrontal cortex, okay? Now, the prefrontal cortex is the, the part of our brain that is responsible for logic. It is the logical, rational part of our brain. So let me give you an example. You hear a noise in the middle of the night, and your amygdala turns on high gear, it fires, and it says, you're gonna die! Your prefrontal cortex is the thing that pops in and it tells you, listen, man, chill. You're not going to die. It's just the cat, right? And then the next thought from your prefrontal cortex is what to do with the stupid cat that just scared you half to death. And then you probably find yourself thinking, why do I have a cat? Am I really a cat person? I should probably get a dog, right? That is your prefrontal cortex. So without the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala simply just responds according to to program it. Green trucks are bad. And many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we would, we've got some traumas, we've got some triggers, and these triggers in our life uh, cause our amygdala to fire up with fear, with anxiety, with worry, and I want to take some time to talk about this because in scripture, we see very clearly that, you know, Jesus didn't say, you know, let your hearts be troubled, right? He doesn't say that. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled, right? The, the angel, you know, didn't arrive on the glorious day of Jesus's birth and say, glory in the highest and stress and anxiety, on earth, right? Paul doesn't show up on the scenes and tell us to be anxious about everything. That's not what he says. He says in Philippians chapter four, verse six, he says it like this. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And then he says, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And, and here's the thing is when we talk about in every situation, this is your financial worries. This is your battle with addiction. This is the marriage challenges that you face in your life. This is the job interview that you need to go well tomorrow. Paul says, in every situation, by prayer and petition, present your requests to God. And the peace of God. And this is what I want to talk about is how do we experience this heavenly peace? And Paul tells us very clearly, listen, this is how you experience the heavenly peace. You experience it through prayer. 
through prayer. I mean, have you ever heard, you know, people say this before, you know, they're maybe in a bad situation and they make the statement, you know, I guess all we can do now is pray, right? It's like God is up in heaven and, you know, God's thinking, you know, all you can do is pray. Like God's like, is this it? Like it's the end. Like this is all we have left. It's over if all you have left to do is pray. But I've realized something is that prayer is never a last resort, Prayer needs to become our first response because you see, prayer is powerful, right? Prayer is this amazing gift that we've been given. We can go before the throne of grace. We can present our request to the creator, the God of the universe. And, and that in our, our most dire times of need, the Bible says that whatever we ask in, in his name, according to his will, that our father hears those requests. Our, our dad, our loving father who, who sent Jesus to die on the cross for us, this guy hears our request. This is what prayer is. And let me tell you, not only does prayer access the heart of God, but prayer physiologically changes the chemistry inside of our brain. This is why Paul tells us, right, that we are to renew our mind, that we're to transform our mind. And, and, and this is where, you know, a few decades ago, Neuro, ne neurologists, they believe that the brain doesn't change after adolescence, right? They believe that once you hit a certain age, whoever you are, whatever you believe, this is your belief system for the rest of your life. This is, you know, if you were an addict today, you're going to be an addict forever. If you deal with this trauma or that trauma or this thing or that thing, it's going to be that way forever. And and since then, over the last you know, few years or so, they've discovered this thing, and the term is called neuroplasticity. And that simply means that our brains are constantly changing. They are constantly re regenerating. They are constantly rewiring. And, and they've discovered that what is it that changes the brain? It's thoughts that change our brain. Now, to take it a step further, one of the things that I have been studying in preparation for this series is a thing called neurotheology, okay? It's also known as spiritual neuroscience, okay? And what spiritual neuroscience is, is it's this study that studies the relationship between our brain and our belief in God and our adherence to the principles that God has set out for us to live according to. And, and, and it comes out with this one very amazing result that they have discovered that prayer physiologically changes the brain. Okay, now one of the kind of the leading, I'm sure most of you have heard of her, the leading neuroscientist where this is concerned is Dr. Caroline Leaf. And she makes a statement that says this, that it's been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change, the brain, the, can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan, okay? 12 minutes a day, if you'll focus and commit to 12 minutes a day over eight weeks, you will see such a change inside of your brain that it's able to be noticed on a brain scan. Okay, this is crazy, but this is what the Apostle Paul teaches us. He teaches us that prayer has the ability to change us. Okay, now here's the thing. Just as toxic thoughts, negative thoughts end up hurting our brain, prayer and an intentional focus on God's word has the ability to change us, right? Prayer heals our brain. Paul tells us that prayer and focus on the word of God renews our mind. This is why he tells us, don't be conformed to the ways, the thought processes, the, the intellect of the world. Don't let your brain be conformed to those things, but be renewed by grabbing a hold and forcing your brain to be transformed to the word of God. Okay? So it begs the question, why then do we worry? Right? Why do we panic? Why, why do we have anxiety? Why do we find ourselves living on the edge? And, and while 
please hear this. There are many reasons. I don't mean to minimize all of our experiences, but one of the main reasons that science has found is that we are experiencing what I will call an amygdala hijack, right? Where we enter into a situation and our brain is like, panic, survive, right? Prepare for the worst case scenario. Like, don't stop to pray. Are you kidding me? You need to get up and, and do what I mean to save yourself. Be as selfish as you need to be because we need to survive, right? And this is what scientists say, but what Paul says is that our mind is dominated by sinful thinking. So I ask again, what is worry? And, and I would define worry as this, that it's the sin of distrusting the promises and the power of God. Now, in a very simple terms, is that prayer is simply getting into a situation, experiencing a situation, and making the statement that, God, I don't think you're big enough to do this. And Paul tells us, he says, listen, instead of letting our sinful, unregenerated nature and thought processes and our traumas and our triggers control our mind, he's saying, listen, instead of allowing your amygdala to hijack the expectation of your life and keep you stuck in old, bad ways of thinking, he says, choose, right? He's He's talking to us about then our prefrontal cortex, the logical part of our brain. Choose to let the spirit direct our thinking. This is what he says in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. He says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, right? But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, those, this is us, us, us believers, followers of Christ, as we are controlled by the Holy Spirit, we think about things that please the Spirit. Verse 6 says, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind, and here we go again, leads to life and peace. And so Paul is saying, listen everybody, this is why we choose to take every thought captive, right? I'm taking every thought captive. That, that means that any thought, not just some thoughts, not just some of the time, but any thought that is inconsistent with the word of God, I, I grab them. I grab them inside of my mind and I make them obedient to Christ. In other words, what Paul is saying is, listen, I will not be dominated by my sinful, negative thinking, but I'm going to demolish the thoughts that try to exalt themselves, that try to make me feel as though the thing that I'm worrying about is bigger than God. Paul is saying this, listen, it's out with the old. He's saying the old thinking, all this old thought processes can only lead us to anxiety, to fear, to worry. And God is promising us a life of peace. And, you know, sometimes I know that I can say these things to people and, you know, people sometimes respond to this thing like, really, like, give it to God, right? Like, what does that even look like? What does that even mean, right? It's, you know, it sounds real irresponsible to just give this care over to God somewhere. And, you know, people want to say that, you know, you're just living in denial, you know, that if we're just going to give it to God, it's just, I don't want to deal with my problems. But, but let me tell you what I do. Let me tell you what does it look like in my mind to live by faith. It's very simple. It looks like this. Number one, I do what I can do. Right? If I want to get healthy, if I want to lose some weight, I'm going to start eating healthy. Right? If I want to get into a good school, I'm going to study. If I have worries about financial security, I'm going to budget, right? I'm, I'm going to spend less than I make, right? So, so I'm going to do the things that I can do. Like, what can I physically do right now to make the situation even just a little bit better? The second thing I do is I give to God what I can't do, right? We, we all have things that we cannot control. I can't control people. I can't control the outcome of situations. I can't control the future, 
And so instead of worrying about things that I cannot control, I choose to give God what I can't do. But let me tell you, number three, the most important thing is that I'm going to trust God no matter what. No matter how much I can do, can't do, how much God can do, how much I think, how much. No, no, the whole process relies on I'm going to trust God. And I'm going to ask you this as you're sitting there to imagine what would it feel like to live your life with a heart of peace? You know, imagine what it would feel like to wake up in the morning and just feel peaceful, to go to sleep at night without a racing mind. You just, you know, lay on your pillow and this is crazy. You just fall asleep, right? Imagine what it would feel like to live a life of joy where you are excited about the new things that the day would bring. And there's just a pep in your step. There's a song in your heart. Imagine what it would feel like to have peace of mind, Or you could walk through a day, walk through a difficult situation, and you're not worried, you're not fearful. Imagine what it would feel like to go into a new place, a new space in life, to walk out of this pandemic, honestly, with a heart that says, I trust God. And can I tell you something this morning? This is possible. But it's also a choice. And we choose, where am I going to let my mind go? Because if your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts, maybe some of you need to do what I had to do. I had to step back and say, do I actually like the direction that my thoughts are taking me? And, and honestly, when I looked at my life, I didn't. You know, I found myself thinking thoughts, you know, that, that you know, life is hard and Oh, I'm just so tired. I'm so overwhelmed. I, you know, I just can't keep up with this. I just can't figure it out. I just don't know what to do. I feel so overwhelmed by the pressures of life. And, and I had to stop and choose in that moment to say, I'm not going to let these thoughts dominate my life anymore, but I'm going to demolish these arguments with the truth of the word of God. Because can I tell you, if you don't control what you think, you can never control what you do. And this is what I'm going to encourage you to do is just simply this, that I'm going to encourage you to identify what is the truth, right? If you are mentored by me, if you're counseled by me, you'll know that one of the very first things that I'll ask you to do, you could come to me with a thought, a business, a promise, something, and you're like, this is what I believe God wants me to do. And the very first thing that I would ask you is, what's your scripture? Because a good idea, a good thought is great, but a promise, a scripture, the word of God is more, it's better. And then you identify the truth, and then you got to write it, you got to think it, you got to confess it until you believe it. You write it, you think it, you confess it, as long as it takes until you actually believe it, right? It looks like this, right? I confess that Jesus is first in my life and I exist to serve and glorify him, right? I confess that I'm disciplined, that the Christ that's in me is stronger than the wrong desires in my life. I confess that I'm growing closer to Jesus every day. And because of Christ, my my family is closer, my body is stronger, my faith is deeper, and my leadership is sharper. I confess that I'm creative, I'm innovative, I'm driven, I'm focused, I'm blessed beyond measure because the Holy Spirit dwells in me. That That I confess that my words, my thoughts, my imaginations are under the power of Christ. And and that I take all thoughts captive and make them obedient. To Christ. And this is what it's about. It's about declaring what's true about you. Not what the facts say, not what the situation says, not what the doctor says or your banker says. No, I'm going to confess about myself what is true. And then I'm going to write it. I'm going to think it. I'm going to confess it till I believe it. Right. And here's the truth. You are not a hostage to your unhealthy thoughts. Right. The weapons that you fight with are not weapons of this world but that you have divine power to demolish strongholds. 
that you take every thought captive, that worry is not your master, that you trust in God and that his peace guards your hearts and guards your minds and guards your soul in Christ Jesus, that you are not a slave to your bad habits. You are not a prisoner to addiction, but you have been rescued from the power of darkness and brought into God's amazing kingdom of light. Listen, church, you cannot control what happens to you. But we talked about this on week one. You can control how you frame it. Can I tell you, if you get nothing out of this series other than this one simple fact, never, ever, 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 ever interpret God through your circumstances. Instead, choose to interpret your circumstances through the goodness of God And then like Paul says, bathe everything in prayer. This is why Paul says and tells us, right, that we can be anxious about nothing. But that in everything, right, through prayer and petition, we can present our requests to God. In everything, in every situation, come on right now, whatever you're going through, whatever you're thinking about, whatever's happening in your life, the Bible says, be anxious about nothing, But in everything, through prayer and petition, present our request to God. It says this, then the God of peace, then the peace of God, the peace that transcends all understanding, this will guard your hearts and it will guard your minds in Christ. Listen, there will always be a battle inside of your mind. But you can choose to let Jesus win this battle. And you do it simply by bringing every thought into captivity, simply by replacing, letting Jesus replace every lie, every thought, every trauma, every situation. Let Jesus replace those things with the truth. Because can I tell you, church, when you know it, when you have it, when you see it, when you confess it, when you write it, when you believe it, when you know this truth, the Bible says it will set you So Heavenly Father, we we come to you in this place of humility. Lord, each of us having gone through life, stuff, situations, traumas, we got triggers and addictions and we got things. and, And Lord, we see very clearly in your scripture that says we don't have to identify with those things anymore. We don't have to let those things be our calling card, be our identifiers. But your word tells us that simply by giving your word our attention, our focus, our thought time, our meditation time, that we can begin to see those things happen and change and be transformed in our life. Listen, if that's you and you'd say, absolutely, Alex, this is me. I've been going through that. I've had traumas. I've had situations. I've been going through troubles. I've been Letting the things of life, my situation. Maybe you lost your job in COVID. Maybe there's something happening in your physical body and you've been finding yourself identifying or letting those things be your identity. And you'd say, listen, that's me, but I don't want to live that way anymore. I'm going to ask you very simply to just, this is going to sound crazy because maybe in your living room right now, but I believe that something happens when we respond externally. I'm going to ask you simply to just raise your hand. You can just slip it up real quick and just let it down. I just want to pray for you because I believe this. I believe that God's word can change us. So Heavenly Father, I'm asking that for every man, woman, child, everyone under the sound of my voice who raised their hand to say, it is time to be out with the old, that I'm done with my old ways of thinking. I'm done with my old thought processes and coping mechanisms and patterns and habits and ditches. And I'm choosing, like Paul tells me, I'm choosing to let your word be the guiding light for my life. Father, I'm asking for your grace. You said that you are an ever-present help in our times of need. So I'm asking Heavenly Father for your grace, your help to rest heavily on us, to convict us in moments, to encourage us, to to enliven us in our moment of need. 
Heavenly Father, our desire is not to allow the situations of life to dictate our expectation for the future, but to allow your word to paint for us the picture of the glorious life you died that we could live. Maybe you're finding yourself on the stream right now. Maybe you're in church. Maybe you're at somebody's house and you're like, listen, I need this. You know, if my name wasn't Alex, it would be negative Norman. I'm just a generally negative guy. And maybe that's you. You're saying, I need help with this. I need something that can begin to shape my thought process. I need to know this, Jesus. Maybe that's you. And the Bible tells us that if we simply confess with our mouths and believe in our heart that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that will be saved, we'll enter into a relationship with him and have access to this amazing peace that he promised. So I'm going to ask that as a church family in church and your home and your car, that you just repeat this out loud as we make a decision or recommit our lives to living according to God's truth. Say, Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God sent from heaven to be the Savior that I need. I believe that you are that savior. You are the son of God. And I ask you to come into my life. Lead me, guide me, direct me in your truth. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.